Namaste. So here we are continuing with Vyabhichari Bhavas, also called Sanchari Bhavas. <clears throat> and these are the friction, the feelings that apparently go against the main rati in the devotees. And I just want to reiterate here uh, to make it perfectly clear. We are talking about emotions in relationship with the Ishta Devata, the principal form of the Godhead, which one's nature is to worship. So we're not talking about mundane emotions or emotions in relation to external sense objects. And this is because uh, mundane emotions aren't ecstatic. In fact, they're only painful. But spiritual emotions, bhavas, are totally ecstatic and pleasurable. And that's the main difference, that <clears throat> these feelings, even though they are apparently painful or difficult, are actually experienced as great bliss. So let's continue on with the 33 Vyabhichari Bhavas. <laughs> so many, huh? Number 17, Jadyam. Absence of the ability to decide anything which arises from hearing or seeing desirable or undesirable things or from separation is called Jadyam. This occurs previous to or following moha, inoperative mind. In this state, blinking of the eyes, silence, and forgetfulness occur. The next one is vrida. The state of bashfulness, the opposite of audacity, arising from just meeting one's lover, from performing forbidden actions, from praise or neglect, is called vrida, shyness. In this state, there is silence, anxiety, covering the head, writing on the ground, and hanging the head. So sometimes when we have a strong feeling, we don't like to express it because of bashfulness. But this leads to vrida, huh? where one is like, looking at the ground, or maybe writing with one's toe on the ground. You know, it's a very attractive uh, mood for a lover. Avahitta. The external action of wanting to hide one's external symptoms because of thinking oneself low is called avahitta. In this state, hiding one's limbs so others will think one is something else glancing elsewhere, useless actions, and clever use of words occur. The ancient authorities say that the bhava which conceals one's anubhavas, external symptoms, is called avatita vyabhichari bhava, smriti, scrutiny of previous experience that arises from strict practice or from seeing similar objects is called smriti, remembrance. In this state, shaking the head and moving the brows occur. For example, if one is trying to understand something and recalls a previous experience or a quotation from Shastra, let's say, <clears throat> this is called smriti or anusmriti, which means remembrance. And then what comes afterwards is an emotional reaction depending on the nature of the memory. Next, vitarkaha. Arriving at a conclusion based on error, doubt, or inference is called vitarka, conjecture. In this state, moving the brows and moving the head and fingers occur. Some say that tarka means to draw conclusions about objects capable of being judged. Now, scholars and logicians do this all the time, vitarka, and it's often translated as false logic, means 
that one uses inductive reasoning rather than the deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is called avaroha, or upwards logic. And deductive reasoning is called downwards uh, logic because it's based on the authority of the Shastra. And this is really the only reasoning that leads to correct conclusions. When one follows the uh, Shastra, because, as we have asserted many times, that the Shastra is of divine origin. It comes from the breathing of Mahavishnu, especially the four Vedas, Upanishads, Vedanta, and Tantras, and those early scriptures. Later scriptures, like the Puranas, Itihasas, and uh, so on, the commentaries, are of obviously human origin. Even the author, in many cases, has signed them. So, in that case, we can use critical scholarship to determine what is relevant, what is not relevant. <clears throat> For example, this Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu that we're following contains many quotations given as examples which do not appear in any other Shastra. They're simply made up. So uh, we don't take those very seriously. We rather uh, look into the ancient books like Upanishads for better examples. Number 22 is Chinta. Pondering, arising from not attaining a desired object or from attaining an undesirable object, is called chinta. In this state, there is heavy breathing, hanging of the head, writing on the ground, change of color, sleeplessness, prattle, and fever. Number 23, matihi. Ascertaining a meaning after consulting scripture is called mati. In this state, performing necessary actions after cutting doubts and delusions, giving instructions to students, and defeating others' arguments and opposite conclusions occur. For example, in this series, um, the source that we're using, the Shastra, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, uh, is heavily doctrinal and very much focused on Krishna Bhakti. Well, that's not bad. However, they exclude other forms of bhakti, for example, to the mother or to Shiva, or to even other forms of Vishnu, such as Mahavishnu. And uh, this gives the impression that only Krishna is God. And later on, we'll analyze the historical forces that brought this scripture into existence and why it was written the way it was and um, how we can adjust our understanding uh, to embrace the entire Vedic teaching. Number 24 is Dhriti. The steadiness of heart arising from attaining realization of the Lord, from absence of suffering in attaining realization of the Lord, and from realizing prema with the Lord is called dhriti. In this state, there is no lamentation for things not attained or for things that have disappeared. Like Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma Na Shochati Na Kankshati. One who is in this state of Brahma Bhuta where one realizes the self to be Brahman. He doesn't lament or desire to have anything. Why? Because he feels complete, satisfied. Oh, finally my search is ended. Now I know the truth. And the truth is, aham brahmasmi. So the secret, which is, isn't really much of a secret <laughs> after all this discussion, <clears throat> is that these transcendental emotions are really for liberated souls, those who already have moksha. 
That's why it's stated in the scriptures that a pure devotee has no desire for liberation. Why? He has it already. <laughs> why should you desire something you already have? So in this way, uh, these pure emotions, pure transcendental feelings are only for the liberated souls. Harsha. Happiness of the heart arising from seeing or attaining one's desired object is called harsha. In this state, standing of the hair on end, perspiration, tears, glowing face, confusion, avega, insanity, unmada, indecision, jadata, and fainting, moha, occur. So one can become so happy that you just that you just lose it. <laughs> That's a wonderful state. <laughs> it's like you don't care anymore whether your actions or words are appropriate or inappropriate or what people think of you or you know anything really uh, external anymore because one has reached the desired object of complete self-realization. Aotsukyam, inability to tolerate the passing of time arising from desire to see or attain a desired object is called Aotsukyam, impatience. In this state, there is drying of the mouth, haste, pondering, and prominence of breathing. 27 is Aogriam. Ferocity arising from offenses and harsh words is called augria. In that state, killing, binding, shaking the head, shouting loudly, and beating occur. This is a very, very prominent emotion in uh, the pastimes of the Divine Mother. When she sees the demons hurting the devotees or blaspheming, criticizing God in any form, she becomes enraged. Off with their heads! <laughs> Amarshaha. Intolerance arising from contempt, insult, or other causes is called amarsha, indignation. In this state, perspiration, shaking the head, change of color, pondering, looking for methods, shouting, turning away, and beating occur. So it's mentioned in the scriptures that one should not tolerate blasphemy. And blasphemy means unduly criticizing the personality of Godhead or God Brahman or any of the great devotees of the Lord. And, and this is common, unfortunately, in today's world with rampant atheism everywhere, and also that uh, sectarianism has led to devotees of one form of Godhead criticizing devotees of other forms, like the long-running uh, debate between devotees of uh, Vishnu and devotees of Shiva, which is completely stupid because <laughs> the scriptures say that Vishnu and Shiva are identical. They're both Brahman. So leave it. Otherwise, you know, you might get beat up. <laughs> 29 is Asuya. Hatred arising from others' increase of good fortune or qualities is called Asuya, envy or fault finding. In this state, malice, disrespect, insult, fault finding, speaking ill of others, casting evil glances, and moving the eyebrows occur. But this is a very dangerous feeling. That when we see someone who is fortunate, I, I experienced this when I got realization of my Ishta Devata. And I realized my eternal nature and position and relationship with him. And the neophyte devotees who were around me didn't accept this at all. I was in bliss. I was ecstatic. And I was enjoying like anything. 
and they were just hateful and envious. And they even destroyed my ashram and the whole uh, teaching platform that I had built up over six or seven years of intense work. So this is a very dangerous feeling and should be avoided at all costs, especially towards devotees. We may not understand their bhava. We may not understand the nature of their service. But that's between them and their ishtadevata. It's really none of our business, so butt out. Number 30 is chapalyam. Chapalam, insolence, means inconsiderateness of the heart arising from attraction or repulsion. In this state, lack of judgment, rough words, and careless actions occur. 31. Nidra. Suspension of external awareness arising from pondering, lack of energy, natural tendency, and fatigue is called nidra, or sleep. In this state, rubbing the limbs, yawning, inaction, heavy breathing, and closing the eyes occur. The state just prior to extinguishing of consciousness, in which there is appearance of one's ishta devata without particular pastimes, is called nidra for the devotees. So this is not ordinary sleep. For example, last night I was lying down, I had been chanting my mantra and <clears throat> listening to Lalita Sahasranamam and everything, and I noticed <clears throat> there's a moment where the attention passes away from the gross body and into the subtle body. And at that time, I always perceive brilliant light of Brahman. And last night, because I was thinking of her a lot, <laughs> I saw my Ishtadevata, uh, Sri Kamakshi, riding on a lion. Brilliant. I mean, just a brilliant form, brighter than the sun, and reflecting all kinds of colors and <laughs> energies. And of course, you know, she's always blessing her devotees and uh, giving benediction out of compassion. Uh, so this uh, is the kind of vision that the devotees have before they enter deep sleep. Next to last is shupti, sleep, in which there are various thoughts and experience of objects is called shupti, or dreaming. In this state, there is absence of the functions of external senses, heavy breathing, and closing the eyes. And finally, bodha, enlightenment of appearance of knowledge caused by destruction of ignorance, Moha and sleep is called bodha. Enlightenment occurs after the appearance of knowledge, which occurs after the removal of ignorance. This enlightenment consists of realizing one's identity with Brahman, which destroys unlimited suffering. So if you stayed all the way to the end here, now you get the real nectar. Huh? Enlightenment is one of the things that sweetens the pastimes of the devotees of the Lord. And it occurs after removal of ignorance. What is removal of ignorance? Watching these videos, for example, <laughs> or reading the Shastra, studying it deeply, and understanding one's actual nature and position. You see, enlightenment is not something you get. It's not a thing, and it's not something that's removed from you either. It's not a transformation, as the New Age people say. No. Enlightenment is our original nature. And by accumulating transcendental knowledge from authorized sources, one realizes that nature, which is there all the time. But just like um, Shushupti and Turiya states of consciousness, they're always there. We just don't see them. 
we don't recognize them because of lack of knowledge. So when we get that knowledge and we understand the actual position, then, <laughs> like Dave was telling me the other day, uh, I have a student in New York City, and he recently got enlightened, which is so wonderful. I'm, I'm so happy for him. Then he was telling me, actually, I saw that I was always like this. I was always Brahman. I am never not Brahman. <laughs> but simply that knowledge or that recognition was covered by ignorance. And as soon as that ignorance is removed, enlightenment takes place. And this is perhaps the most powerful or um, most desirable of all these bhavas <clears throat> because it leads to the realization of pure love for the Godhead, for the Ishta Devata. Next time, we'll discuss the overall structure of bhava and how these different bhavas combine and act together, confirmed, <laughs> to cause transcendental rasa. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.